and um, and I'll go through sort of the programs and then um, sample submission for a few of our surveys. Um, actually, most of you probably won't be doing that, but we'll get into that more towards the end about sample submission. So anyway, um, we've got all these beautiful places in Oregon, and these are all shot in Oregon, these pictures. Um, by the way, most of the images on this presentation are shamelessly borrowed from the web, so um, they are not my photography, and um, <laughs> they're from lots of places. But anyway, these are all pictures in Oregon. You know we have a beautiful state, and um, um, the, the growing habitats are uh, very unique. It's, a, it's very special and it's a place worth protecting. So um, that's why we're here. And so um, the purpose of our surveys basically comes from our mission and that is to protect Oregon's agriculture, horticulture and environment and quality of life from damaging insect pests and to enhance or maintain the value of Oregon's agricultural and horticultural products. And so we're here for the environment, we're here for the growers, and ultimately here for the people. And so how we do that um, in our program is we have an approach called EDRR, which stands for Early Detection and Rapid Response. And um, so what, basically it's what it says, um, you, <laughs> you, you look for something as much as you can, um, you know, given your budget and everything, you, you try and find things early um, before they become a problem. And if you do find something, you get on it, assess it, and hopefully, you know, try and get rid of it. And if it's already past that, then you look at, well, then how do you manage that? But our goal being sort of the front line for um, against invasive species is to um, try and find these things before they're a problem and get rid of them. And we do that uh, with a variety of methods and tools. Um, this, is, this is just a sampling of a lot of the traps, the kinds of traps that we use. And we also do visual surveys um, uh, for a number of things like mollusks. Um, although we have trapped for mollusks using beer of all things in the past. Um, but uh, the, um, yeah, we've, we've done pitfall traps. That's not on here and those are commonly used. We're not doing pitfalls this year. Um, but anyway, we use a, a wide variety of, of traps. And um, you've seen Jessica's presentation. Of course, this is a Japanese beetle trap, and this is a gypsy moth trap, and that's probably 90% or better of what's going to be out there this year. And so what we do, um, we're using our methods for detection. And then if we find a target, um, first thing we'll want to do is delimitation trapping, or delim trapping, we call it. And um, what that is, is essentially um, real high densities of traps in an area. And so that could be like 25 to 49 per square mile. And we might do that for two or three years. And so let's say using gypsy moth as an example, we would say we caught one moth and we would trap that for another two years, another two seasons. and see, you know, are there more moths? Then there's probably a breeding population. Do you not catch any more? Then it was probably just a single introduction. Um, and and that's, that's very typical of sort of how we approach um, that kind of thing. So, so we have a, the uh, delimitation trapping first. And then um, sometimes if, if it's something we do, we do know there's like a population or, or we think we know the center, we might even opt for, um, for uh, uh, mass trapping. And so those could be up to nine per acre or even more. And you get, you get to a tipping point where you go from what's mass trapping to almost mating disruption. When you have a, a lure and a trap as good as gypsy moth and you're, um, you're dealing with a very, very small population, a sort of a founder population, um, you're actually, that amount of pheromone in that area is actually almost working like um, mating disruption. And so you can you can partly trap out the males in, a, in an area. And in fact, we did that the last couple of years. I'm pretty sure that worked in Corvallis. We had a uh, eradication in Corvallis in 2019. And, um, and that approach seemed to work there. And there are scientific papers by people who work on gypsy moth to sort of back up that principle. 
And so we put it into practice and it, and it actually seems to work. Um, so the other thing that we'll do, we'll get more pin pinpoint um, geographic data on positives. And um, like I said, the traps can actually help remove uh, some of the pest population and, and the, the density we have of JB traps in the eradication area. Um, it actually is catching a fair number of beetles in that area. And so it's probably actually helping remove um, a number of the beetles. It's not going to eradicate them, but <laughs> it, it can help. Um, is there anything? Do I need to check chat or? I guess not yet. I can't really see anything when I'm in this mode. Yeah, no, Rich, you're doing great. Um, okay. Nothing, no questions popped up in chat yet. It's just, it's just like talking to my screen, you know, that's all. It's weird. Yeah, it's very awkward. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Hey, um, I can answer any questions at the end. I can pop off of here and I'm happy to answer anything. So if you guys can save them up, that'd be probably pretty handy too. Um, so we, um, like I said, we we put the traps out. If we find something, then what do we do? So we may need to go back to a site, um, evaluate the site. You know, how did how did a pest come in? Can we find signs of it? We look for damage. In the case of gypsy moth, we look for egg masses, which look like this. Um, and so this is actually these are actually pictures from a gypsy moth find in 2006 in Bend. And these were parts, uh, cars that were bought for parts on eBay from Connecticut and shipped to Oregon. And they had gypsy moth um, stuck to the car parts. These are pupil cases and a bunch of webbing and stuff. And these are um, old egg masses and stuff on here. And here you can actually see the female and an egg mass. There's another female in here with an egg mass. And that's a female, I think. Um, I think this is on a poplar tree or something on this property. And so they were actually there breeding in Bend. Um, it's very, very dry habitat. It's not ideal habitat. And yet there's deciduous trees around and they were, it was a, a breeding population. So we found all sorts of um, life stages in here and they're inspecting the automobiles for, for egg masses and different things. Um, this is uh, um, steel inspections up at the Port of Portland. Um, and this is looking for egg masses for uh, Asian gypsy moth, which comes in a lot on our ships into the ports and stuff. Uh, and, um, and then the other way we evaluate things, we can, we'll look at a map and um, you know, use GIS and say, okay, we had a find here. This was for light brown apple moth in Douglas County in 2018. We had a single find in this apple tree on the side of the road kind of just along a country road. <clears throat> and the the tree was actually here. And so, you know, it was like equidistant from uh, Winston and Roseburg. And we're like, so where did this moth come from? So we, we started looking to, um, you know, possible move in areas, whoops, possible move in areas and um, trying to figure out, you know, the distance involved, where, where that moth could have come from. And it, it may have come from new, new neighborhoods out in this area um, that had new landscape planting, stuff like that. So you have to do site evaluation when you find something and then figure out what your, <clears throat> what your plan is gonna be. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, hopefully if it's, if it's a, a pest we wanna get rid of, we could move to an eradication plan. And, um, if eradication didn't work uh, or it was already found past the point of eradication, we would move into a biocontrol plan, possibly, or some other kind of management plan. And a lot of times OSU gets involved in those and they, you know, they then they would start to do research what how how we're gonna develop um, IPM measures, you know, integrated pest management for a new pest or something like that. This happened with spotted wing drosophila. Um, you know, I guess over a decade ago now, but um, when that was new, it was already out of control. That quickly actually went to OSU and they started working on um, how to deal with management plans, how to work with growers and stuff like that. But before that happens, we try and get to something like eradication. And so um, we've used eradication now for uh, gypsy moth and Japanese beetle and light brown apple moth. This helicopter here was for a gypsy moth spray. I think this might have been Eugene or somewhere up near Portland. I can't remember when this photo was taken, but um, 
this is a typical small helicopter that could do like a square mile eradication um, over maybe 600 acres or so, more than that maybe. Um, this is the you know shows the spray boom down here and uh, the tanks and stuff. And then uh, this is <laughs> some of you working on JB already or, or or have worked on JB in the past probably recognize this area and this maybe this fellow here with General Tree. Uh, this is the gypsy. Uh, excuse me, Japanese beetle eradication in the cedar mill area, and they're applying the granular um, acelephrin to the, the turf here. And then this was a fixed wing aircraft we used um, for light brown apple moth um, eradication in Independence in 2017. So, so eradication takes on different forms as well, depending on what you need it to do. And so this year we're looking for a variety of things. Um, a lot of them we look for sort of every year, but gypsy moth, Asian gypsy moth, Japanese beetle, oriental beetle, light brown apple moth. Um, we're also doing a nursery survey. We did two different nursery surveys or slightly different nursery surveys last year, um, but we're doing nursery survey, um, oak pest survey. So we're gonna be looking for a specific oak habitat, maybe near high risk areas. Um, we have a number of wood board delimitations. Uh, we're looking for um, exotic Vespa or, or Hornet species as well. Um, a lot of this is due, of course, to the threat up on the Washington Canadian border um, with Vespa mandarinia up there, the, the Asian giant Hornet. And uh, in Eastern Oregon, we have apple maggot grasshopper programs. And so, you know, in total, we're looking for 20 plus beetle species, 11 plus moth species, evil exotic murder hornets, uh, fruit fly, voracious grasshoppers, and anything else that doesn't belong. So I'm gonna start with um, gypsy moth and kind of cover an overview of that. Um, this gentleman is Etienne Leopold Trouvelot. He was a Frenchman that moved to uh, Massachusetts in the 1800s and has the dubious distinction of being the guy who brought gypsy moth to North America. Um, so, yeah, um, if you could go back in time and tell this guy no, you know, and <laughs> I don't know what a fix would be, but man, um, I guess we could thank him. We've all got jobs. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, sorry, it's late afternoon. Not my best time slot. But um, so Truvelo brought gypsy moths to Massachusetts in 1869. This was an attempt to increase silk, silk production. He thought he could breed uh, gypsy moths with the native giant silk moths and create um, sort of a uh, an incredible silk, silk producer or something. And um, of course, he obviously knew nothing about genetics. Of course, very few people knew anything about genetics back then. The structure of DNA hadn't even been discovered yet. Um, that wasn't until much later. And so, yeah, breeding, breeding genetics, those kinds of things, um, didn't understand that you couldn't really cross um, two very different species. And so, of course, um, these things escaped. And they started to spread into the woods behind his property. And some of the early control attempts failed, of course. Um, and this is <laughs> an old photo where these, they're actually trying to scrape the egg masses out of the tree. Um, I mean, you just think of like the safety standards we have today and you look at this and you're like, what? I mean, that just wouldn't fly. Um, but anyway, you know, you do what you have to do. And they did back then, and, and but yeah, it didn't work. Uh, this is just some old artwork, old gypsy moth, gypsy moth artwork from the past. Um, and so some of the early controls um, used really nasty stuff. Uh, they started with like lead arsenate, um, of course, then moved to DDT like and other organophosphates, like uh, so many other uh, sort of control programs back then. Um, and you can see some of the old tanks. <clears throat> Um, here, pulled by horse, unless that's mule, I don't know. Looks like pulled by horse. Here's the same kind of spray rig or, or um, um, compressed compressed spray rig, but it's on a barge on a river. 
I mean, we have problems even spraying BTK near waterways these days, and they're spraying like, you know, lead arsenate right on next to a waterway. There was no such thing as drift back then. <laughs> People didn't worry about that stuff, but um, pretty hazardous chemicals, really, um, for one reason or another. And uh, so, yeah, I sprayed from ground, boat, air. Um, and uh, so Gypsy Moth, it re reached the greatest damage in the 70s and 80s after DDT had been phased out in, or started begin uh, getting phased out in 1958, um, gypsy moths started to rebound a little bit. And they were probably resistant to DDT by that point anyway. And so they are probably realizing, you, you probably heard a little bit about DDT use in the past and that um, insects gained resistance to it over time and it became ineffective. <clears throat> and, um, and so, you know, they, they started phasing that out. Oops, where'd my presentation go? I'm so sorry, Rich, that was my fault. I accidentally <laughs> clicked the wrong button. I'm so sorry. No, let that's me, okay. Let sorry. me make you presenter again. No, you're fine. <laughs> I forgot, I, I was trying to click off my camera for a second. <laughs> accidentally clicked the wrong one. There we go. Okay, let me just uh, minimize this again or something. Minimize that. Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, DDT was being phased out. And so, so there was a lot more damage back east again. Gypsy moth was rebounding and, um, and there was a, a, quite a bit more damage. And so, uh, but now for, luckily for uh, eradications, we use an organic formulation of a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis kerstaki. It's quite a mouthful. We just call it BTK. It is a, a bacterial insecticide um, that is specific to caterpillars. So it won't harm um, like bee larvae. It won't harm beetle larvae. Um, uh, you know, it's it's fairly safe to use. It, it can harm certain butterflies, so you do have to be careful, you know, still where you're using it. But in general, it's very effective for getting rid of gypsy moth um, quickly. <clears throat> Oops, what happened here? There we go. Okay, so um, so the larva it has a has a. This is the caterpillar up here. Oops, where'd my cursor go? There we go. So the caterpillar uh, up here, it's very distinctive. It has blue dots in the front and red dots along the back. Um, six red, five blue, I think is the, uh, the general combination. And it uh, has a huge host range on deciduous trees. Um, they have big appetites. They'll, they'll eat over 500 species of trees um, without any, any trouble. And another problem is the larvae can balloon on a silk thread. And so what they'll do is the, the first instar larvae are very small and they can um, basically send a filament of silk out, catch the wind, and they're so lightweight that they'll be um, carried on the wind up into trees. And they can be carried uh, some distance uh, by, by that practice. <clears throat> and so what happens with, when you get extreme gypsy moth defoliation is you'll get um, the canopy damage and, and you'll see some examples here. Uh, these pictures look like this was maybe early spring or it's just dead trees, or you'll see, um, this looks like a forest fire maybe went through, but these are actually, these pictures are actually midsummer, and um, this is from defoliation. There may be some dead trees in here actually because the trees died from multiple years of heavy defoliation, but uh, and that might be what part of this is too. But this is this is actually in the summer. This forest is dead. Almost looks like a bark beetle infestation. But this is all gypsy moth damage. Uh, back east. Rich, someone in the chat box mentioned spiders do the same thing. Can you speak to the difference in the what they look like? Maybe. Um, actually, oh, they're they're very very similar. So spiders will, will send out a filament of silk as well, and they can be carried on the wind because they're so lightweight. The, the, the newborn spiders, the baby spiders, and that's the same as the tiny caterpillars. 
um, it, it's pretty much the exact same thing. That's called ballooning. No, that's a good point. Spiders do that too. And I imagine anything else that could spin silk and was very, very tiny could do it. I'm trying to think if there's other insects that spin a lot of silk. I don't know. Probably not those situations. There are some other things with silk, but there's these things called web spinners, but they're mostly in the ground. So anyway, um, yeah, good question. Um, and so uh, what happens when you get canopy damage like this is obviously important for riparian habitat. Um, and so you'll get increased solar exposure. You can see the amount of sun coming through here where this should be a nice shady forest. Um, that can raise water temperatures and it reduces dissolved oxygen and raises pH. And so this is kind of a, a balanced formula in a healthy stream environment where you have the water temperature and you have um, available oxygen and pH and stuff. And it affects everything from, um, well, the invertebrates in the streams, which are food for the fish and also birds and stuff like that. So it affects the whole ecology of these, these areas. <clears throat> and the same could be said for bark beetle damage. If you had the same, same kind of damage here from, from bark beetles, it would do the same thing. You're, you've got these dead trees, tons of sun exposure, raising the temperatures in these areas. Um, and in urban settings, this, this kind of damage adds landscape costs. So homeowners uh, back east have to spend, I mean, collectively, they're spending millions of dollars on landscape uh, or uh, arborists and people to come out, treat their trees for gypsy moth. Um, and it also adds a uh, level of discomfort because the hairs that come from the larvae can fall out of the trees or the larvae fall out of the trees and the hairs kind of get around and they can get on people and some people are very sensitive to them. And so it can cause, they're called urticating. Um, they're not, not super urticating, but some people are sensitive. It's more like an allergic reaction um, versus being sort of strictly poisonous. Um, but some people are sensitive and can break out and, and, and it can be just uh, uncomfortable. Not to mention that when they're in the trees, these things will poop. And when there's tons of them, they'll, they'll poop, you know, like, you know, all over your patio and stuff. So you'll get caterpillar frass, um, you know, raining down on your backyard barbecue. That doesn't sound very good. Um, and of course, the uh, increased risk of movement um, in having these things. So people will have their RV parked out front, these things will get on the RVs and they get driven to Oregon. So that's how we get them a lot of times. Hey Rich, uh, we have one, one thing, oops, sorry, one quick thing in the chat box. Sure. Beth was wondering if there were gypsy moths in California too, because she's definitely seen caterpillars ballooning on silk in California. Um, yeah, so a lot of small caterpillars will balloon on silk, not, not just gypsy moth. Um, so it could be some other species. Uh, California does do extensive gypsy moth trapping, um, but it does not exist there. So when they find it, they do the same thing we do. Um, they basically try and eradicate it. They'll set delim traps, they'll eradicate it, get rid of it. And they do not have established gypsy moth populations there. Um, it's also a lot hotter and drier down there as a rule. Not that gypsy moth couldn't do well in many areas, but um, the warmer and drier the habitat, the worse gypsy moth is gonna do. It, it really likes like the Northeast. It likes dense forests, um, a fair amount of moisture. It also needs cool uh, winters or actually colder winters, um, which a lot of California doesn't have. Northern California does, but... Um, you know, Southern California doesn't really. So like you go down into Florida, even on the East Coast, gypsy moth doesn't occur in Florida. It starts getting too hot. Um, and so it ends somewhere, you know, I want to say like Northern Georgia um, uh, in the habitat there. Um, not that it can adapt, maybe it will in the future, I don't know. But anyway, it doesn't exist in California, but there are a lot of caterpillars that do do balloon like that. Um, so this is the, the uh, life cycle, and I don't know if you can see this very well, I don't know how big your screen is, but um, this shows that most of the life cycle it spends as an egg, uh, or most of the year it spends its life as an 
in the in the uh, egg mass like this, and um, the eggs will develop, uh, go into diapause, and then they'll they'll break diapause in the winter sometime, and then they'll emerge when they have enough like uh, degree days, um, and so they'll emerge. They they'll start hatching in April, right around here, and the caterpillars can go from here to here. And then the pupae, roughly from about mid-June to maybe early August. And then you see adults from about mid-July to early September. So there's sort of different phases here about how long that these life stages can go. And you can see egg masses starting anywhere from um, about the beginning of August on all the way until they hatch. <clears throat> And this just shows the different stages. So these are little eggs sort of in this um, kind of uh, frothy mass that's mixed with body hairs from the female. And that's what creates the egg mass. And then this is a, a full grown larva. This is the pupa of the female and the male. And um, you can see a big size difference there. And then the, uh, this is the male moth. This is what you would be looking for in the traps since the traps only catch male moths. And then the female is white like this. The, the male moth is brown, the female is kind of white. And so um, the Oregon program, so there's a, a little bit of history here, a couple of main things. So Oregon started surveying for gypsy moth um, in 1973. It was the first year we actually had a trapping program. Um, the first gypsy moth was caught in 1979. And that was in Salem, I believe. And then the first eradication started in 1981. And I was also in Salem. And um, that eradication went for two years um, because, like, after a thousand moths were caught in South Salem. So it went from, I guess, to about 1983. Um, and so they, but they got rid of that population in South Salem. And then in 1985 to 88, we had what was called the Gypsy Moth Wars um, in Lane County. And um, this is the largest GM eradication in the Western US. It was um, in um, 1984, uh, 19,000 plus moths were caught in a forested area, I believe, east of Eugene. It was, it was in Lane County. And, um, during this time period, from, from 1985 through 88, that's what, four years, 85, 86, 87, yeah, 88, four years of eradications. And in the summer of 88, they caught one moth. That's pretty good, 19,000 down to one. So um, the eradication strategies are very effective. Um, you have to keep at it, but um, it's great tools for getting rid of gypsy moth. And so, um, so this is our largest survey every year. We put out 12,000, over 12,000 traps statewide uh, for gypsy moth. Uh, we do have great habitat and climate. Um, we have cool forested areas, um, you know, lots of green and leafy stuff for them to eat. And um, there's a high risk uh, of introduction every year with people either moving here or vacationing here or um, cargo being shipped from back east. And like I mentioned, the good good news is um, you, we've got great tools for detecting it. We've got great tools for eradicating it. Um, it has only one generation per year. So you don't have to keep continually spraying multiple generations. And the females don't fly. And so they're actually fairly slow to move because the females, um, you know, they'll move by ballooning larvae and stuff like that. But the, whoops, but the, but the females um, don't fly. The males go find the females and then they mate and the females drop their eggs where they are. And so that's, that's really uh, a key thing in keeping this thing from spreading um, quickly. I mean, it can still spread and it does spread back east, but, it, but much more slowly. However, <clears throat> there's a thing called Asian gypsy moth, which you probably already know about or may know about or may not know about. Um, and so, uh, we're looking for this one also, and the traps that you set for gypsy moth also detect Asian gypsy moth and a few other um, uh, subspecies of the gypsy moth. 
and um, it's the same lure that's used and everything. But um, there's some main differences. So Asian gypsy moth has a much wider host range, includes conifers. Can develop on um, like Doug fir, hemlock, pine, uh, and it can on those just fine, is happy to eat them. Um, the larvae can develop faster, they grow larger and they eat more. And the reason partly they grow larger, they make bigger moths um, in the end. And um, and so they, they're also greatly attracted to lights. And this is a real problem because um, there are a, a lot of lights a lot of times in the port areas in Asia where the ships are docked and everything. And so these things will, they can be in huge numbers there. And so the females are attracted to these lights. They get onto the ships and they can lay their, um, their egg masses on the ships. And one of the worst things is the females can fly. If you look at this, this um, body volume to wing surface area ratio, these things are huge. I mean, the body's not that much bigger than the North American or European gypsy moth, which can't fly. But if you look at the wings, um, they're, they're much larger. And, um, and, their, and their flight muscles here are, you know, well-developed and they have no trouble flying. And so as a result, you see situations like this in the Asian ports. Um, this is in uh, Siberia, Japan, Korea, uh, China, and so and there's and there are different like I said there's different subspecies involved. It could be multiple species or multiple subspecies of these things, possibly on here as well as other moth species that aren't gypsy moths. <clears throat> but um, they get in in huge numbers like this, and they're laying their egg masses. And this these were all attracted to lights around those areas. You can see there's quite a bit of vegetation sometimes in these areas as well. Rich, Angie is asking, what is the evolutionary purpose of wings on the female gypsy moth if it doesn't fly? So um, I would think the more ancestral trait would be that they did fly. And for some reason, the European gypsy moth females uh, lost their ability to fly. So they didn't feel like, I guess, like they needed to fly in an evolutionary sense. Um, and so they, they've lost the, uh, they still have their wings, but they've lost the ability to fly. Now, if you take it a step further, there's another group of um, moths in the Lyman Treaty. They're all called tussock moths. Uh, so Families kind of called tussock moths is a general common name. And the um, there's another group where the females, have completely lost their wings or their wings are so tiny you can barely see them. And so they're actually wingless females and they, and they don't have any you know, chance of flying even. Um, so that, that adaptive, somewhere in there, that adaptive trait for not flying was um, advantageous to the species over time. And so, yeah, so uh, flightless females it was sort of a um, an evolutionary trend in the in the tussock moths, but but I would say the flying female would be more the um, ancestral form, being more normal. And most female moths do fly. So if that answers that. And then um, Bethany, Beth, sorry, yeah, <laughs> Bethany no piggybacked off that and said, "Would not moving make it easier for the males to find them?" Um. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how the pheromones work with the female, but I would think if you're sitting still, you're not a moving target. And the males are very, very sensitive to the female pheromone. And they can find females pretty easily. So the female just doesn't have to spend any energy. She can put all her energy into, say, eggs instead of um, flying, you know. And that maybe that's where the uh, the advantage was, um, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, so yeah, if you're not spending energy on, on uh, flying, you can just sit there and, the, and then the male will come to you. And, and they have you know, huge egg masses. They have over 400 eggs in, in one of those egg masses. So um, they're very fecund is the word, I guess. Um, and, and the, but the female pheromone, it's, you know, the males respond to it so well. That's why our traps work so well. Um, and if we have 
you know, if a, if a gypsy moth can find a female from up to a half mile away, a single female, um, if we put four traps per square mile, we've got a pretty good chance that in the absence of other females, we've got a pretty good chance of zeroing in on getting a gypsy moth and even finding out where it came from possibly. After we put a delimitation out and we get more traps, we can we map that out. We start to see where the positives are, and then you got a, a much better picture of um, where those where that moth maybe came from, and whether or not it's a breeding population. You know. So anyway, this is this just shows the density that you can get for these Asian gypsy moths, and um, so that's a real problem. Um, and uh, we do have. One Asian gypsy moth we caught last year. So this this shows a breakdown of um, uh, what did I do here? Wait a minute. This is the same thing. That's weird. I must have doubled that on a slide somewhere. Anyway, <laughs> uh, th this year we're looking for um, we're looking for uh, gyp well, we look for gypsy moths all over the state. Sorry drifting here um but we found two two last year so there was a, a european gypsy moth up here in columbia county so portland's way down here this is uh this is savi island here and this is up closer to is it rainier something like that anyway um columbia county <laughs> we, we got a, a north american gypsy moth up here and um and then this was an Asian gypsy moth right along the waterway where the ships go. So there's a couple possibilities where this came from. You know, was it a fly off from maybe somewhere in Washington? They do have some port areas, I understand, on their side along the Columbia. Uh, in addition to Vancouver, um, there are some other areas. So did it come from there? Um, did it just, was it a ballooning larva off a ship? and developed on trees right along here? Was it a, an adult moth um, that emerged from a pupa in the summertime with a ship coming up here in the summer? And it was a male moth that was attracted to our trap, which was you know, front line right here along the waterway. So um, anyway, this is gonna get a delimitation around it. And so is this one this year. So there'll be a lot of traps in that area. And we always have increased numbers of traps along the waterway um, for that reason. So we've got a second year delimitation in um, Tillamook County. There was one caught a couple years ago in Pacific City. And then we've got one in Corvallis um, where we did the eradication in 2019. <clears throat> and then our new ones, like I said, are Columbia County and just under the county line here in Multnomah County. The county line is like right there. So that's kind of where we're at this year. Uh, Jessica did a fantastic job of already presenting on Japanese beetles. So I am skipping that and going on to light brown apple moth. Um, hopefully, I can power through these a little more quickly. I, I apologize for the time I'm spending. Um, light brown apple moth has been one of our, our programs for a while now. Um, so some background, it's native to Australia, became a severe pest of apple in New Zealand and Australia actually, um, mostly around the 1950s, um, just as New Zealand was starting to, I guess, get an apple industry. Um, it's established in Great Britain, it's been there since the 1930s, it's been in Hawaii since uh, 1896. So a long time there, but it wasn't found in the mainland until 2007. It was found in Berkeley, California. And by the time California actually started looking for it, uh, the State Department of Agriculture, by the time they started looking, it was already found all over the Bay Area and the um, lot greater Los Angeles area in Southern California. So it was already kind of widespread. They attempted some eradication in um, in the Santa Cruz area, and that was met with tons of resistance, horrible bad press, and they were stopped in their tracks, and it, and it never went anywhere. Um, 
but I'm not sure they could have got a handle on it for how widespread it was at the time. Um, it's, it's not established in other states. And I'm pretty sure we can say it's not established in Oregon. <laughs> Get more into that in a minute. Um, but it has long docu documentation of hosts. It feeds on a lot of plants, over 120 genera of plants, hundreds of species um, all over the world. And I believe it is spreading too a little bit in the um, in the in Europe, um, out of Great Britain. I, I thought it was in some other spots in Europe too, but. So this shows the distribution of where it was in California in 2013. And I just got this updated map this year for 2020, um, showing we've got an addition like was this, dang it. Oh no, there we go, sorry. Uh, uh, this is Mendocino, I can't even read that. Yeah, Mendocino County. Um, so that's positive. I don't see if there's any other counties around here that are new. So they've had to control the spread and treat um, horticultural stock in these areas. So they have sort of like control orders um, that were part of USDA quarantine that they had to adhere to. So it hasn't spread too much beyond, but now they're showing areas versus sort of these individual spots. They're showing larger mass areas as generally infested, but mostly in the same counties. Um, so it's slowly spreading. Um, I don't think California is spending time or resources looking for it, maybe in other places. Maybe they have to, I don't know. Uh, bad news is uh, the USDA is going to deregulate this um, in the very near future, possibly this year. And so California won't be held to um, their, those regulations anymore. And so states like Oregon will put a um, exterior quarantine on a state like California in order for them to um, make sure they are treating material and stuff like that. So um, bad news is again, the proximity to Oregon um, this is, it really increases its like, likelihood that it will come into Oregon since we're probably the best habitat state for this thing to get established in next. Um, we've got great habitat here, uh, particularly on the west side. Um, let's see, and again, the, the infested nurseries, shipping plants, uh, people bringing their own plants with them when they're moving up here from California. They bring their potted plants from their yard or whatever. And then, so that's, I think that's how we're getting these things. Um, the, the most obvious, if you're using Occam's razor to <laughs> figure out likelihood, that's probably it. Um, and so we started our surveys in 2003 for light brown apple moth. We've, we first found it in Independence in Polk County. And at that time it was a single moth. Um, and then we did delim trapping, delimitation trapping for two more years. It was at least two years, maybe it was three years, I don't know, but two more years, no moths caught. Um, and that was due to California nurseries shipping dirty plants. They were not um, following the USDA guidelines apparently. And um, I guess USDA was not enforcing those guidelines apparently maybe too. So. Uh, Anyway, we did some trapping again as part of a different survey. Actually, it was our, our orchard survey in um, 2015, and we found two moths. Um, and so we set up a DLIM, and um, the following year, in 2016, we found three moths. And so, we, okay, we, there actually is something going on here. Um, probably a very small population getting started. And um, so we actually did a full eradication in 2017. And uh, so this is, this is what light brown apple moth looks like, you know, a mounted specimen. This is uh, the nursery and in independence. This is um, this is sort of what our delimitation map looked like there. So these sort of um, nested circles that are kind of defined here, 
these are centered around the positive point. So there's probably a point here, here, and here. And so this is sort of the center square mile density. And then this would be the surrounding square miles around that out to five square miles around each find. And so it kind of gives this lumpy bubble here. Um, but you can't, you can't put traps in a lot of places because these are agricultural fields or they're inaccessible um, forest areas or places like that. And so that's why you see this kind of little bit strange distribution in the trapping. This is what our LBAM traps look like. I'm just gonna chime in really quick for Portland yeah. Field Office. Mm -hmm. For those that might be working in the LBAM delimitation, Rich did show you that picture of the moth on the previous slide. I just want you to know that there are a lot of little moths that look exactly like mm -hmm. that. Um, so when yeah. we get these traps and change out inserts and stuff, uh, don't be alarmed. You're going to see a lot of little moths on the insert. Um, that's why we give them to Rich so that he can look at them. In a lot of cases, he actually has to dissect the genitalia to confirm if it's a light brown apple moth or not. Um, so just in case, like I, my first year trapping, I had light brown apple moth traps and I was sending pictures to my coordinator the first time I checked them. I'm like, I think I caught a bunch of light brown apple moths. And um, there's a lot of little moths that look exactly like this. And so Chantel just, just something is, to be aware of. Chantel is speaking from experience. So um, two years ago now, right? Two years ago, she was actually assisting me in um, screening the LBAM traps for positives and stuff. So I actually trained her to look for LBAM and sort it out from some of the other things. So she has quite a bit of experience <laughs> actually in looking for these. Um, yeah, and there are there are a number of um, non-targets that, that can look very, very similar. And these moths are really variable. I took that other slide out that I had that showed some of the variability. I, I didn't have a slide that showed some of the non-targets. I thought that was getting to be too much, but um, yeah, they're they're even within the species, it's it's variable, and so it can look like other forms of other species, and vice versa and stuff. So, yeah, it, you you do have to be careful in looking through these, and I really encourage people when you go check these traps, um, if you're changing a lure, just change the insert, put a clean one in it. Um, if there are any insects, even if you don't think you see moths on the insert. If it's got some other insects on it, we can look at those too. It's better just to have a clean insert and um, and sort of keep track of that time window really tight. So if you do catch something, and I'll get into this on the sample submission, if you do catch something, it it narrows down the time window when we when we know when that flew into the trap. That that's really helpful, especially things you don't know very well. Uh, species you don't know well, like what would their biology be like in Oregon? Maybe it's different than where they are native to, and maybe they have um, a different flight period when they're active and things like that. And so learning more about them in a new habitat is also crucial to understanding maybe how to get rid of them. So, Rich, um, can you, can I ask a question? Yeah. It's Annie. Can you comment to how there's sometimes like the copycat, like was it a last year or the year before, how everybody, the phones went crazy when the Pandora moth hatched because of the, like they thought they were gypsy moth, right? right and it's right. all because of the antenna. Like, well, we know if there's a new hatching of something that is a copycat, you would make sure everybody's aware. So like when the Pandora moth happened, we were all told, the co the public would be more likely to think they're seeing a gypsy moth if we were out in the field, right? Yeah, I mean, you're you're gonna probably during the season you might get questions from people um, saying, "I saw a bunch of these, you know, I think they're gypsy moth," or "I saw a bunch of these, I think they're gypsy moth," you know, and they're, and they're other species and they do have um, sort of emergence periods throughout the season and and there's so there's a lot of things that aren't gypsy moth obviously um and but you know other people aren't going to necessarily know that they just they just hear about gypsy moth and they see a whole bunch of something coming out and they try and put two to two together and you know so they 
they'll they'll they may ask you questions along those lines, and um, and usually our technicians should have materials to show people what gypsy moth looks like. You can make comparisons and and show them the differences and things like that. Um, light brown apple moth is one of those that's so small. You're talking about something that is, you know, 12 millimeters wingspan. You know, it. It's not going to be noticed by most people, and if they did mistake one of our other moths that we have that looks kind of like it, um, you know, it's more likely going to be one of those because they can be in huge numbers and they do look like light brown apple moth. And, and there are a couple of species that can be very, very numerous in people's gardens, and they eat almost everything. So, um, yeah, I think you're less likely to get called on some of those you're way more likely to be called or you know asked about something that someone thinks is a gypsy moth but, but yeah annie's right there's there's periods where things are going to come out and people will mistake them for gypsy moth one way or another <clears throat> so um so our eradication in in um Polk County, so this is what the uh, this is where the spray block was. So you can see the same bubbles here. This is where the trapping delim grid was laid out. And this was the spray area inside this, this center area. So this is 510 acres. And so um, the approach that we took uh, was the first like it for light brown apple moth. I don't know that light brown apple moth has ever been eradicated from any area where it has been introduced. Um, and so uh, we used a combination of mating disruption, which is basically the pheromone, um, so that it confuses the males, and the BTK, which is used for GM. And this combination is used for gypsy moth back east as part of their slow the spread program. And so what they do is they'll spray the caterpillars during the caterpillar phase with the BTK, and during when the adults are out they'll spray the mating disruption so that the males have a much harder time finding the females in space um, basically in the environment um, and so the combination is actually slowing the spread of gypsy moth in the case of lbam here we had such a small population that um, the mating disruption acted like dropping a hydrogen bomb on the lbam um, I mean, it just it just made it literally impossible, I think, for them to find the females. Now, this is how it was sold by the company selling the mating disruption. But in theory, that's how it should work. And it apparently is how it did work. Um, and so we saturated this area with pheromone. And um, now this was put on by this uh, fixed wing aircraft. It was a company out of Michigan. Um, they actually do the spraying for gypsy moth back east. They're one of the companies that's contracted uh, with USDA uh, to do that, or Forest Service maybe. And um, But they came all the way out here to Oregon to do our light brown apple moth treatment because they have the equipment to put the mating disruption product on and then switch out their spray equipment to then handle the, the um, BTK. So it's kind of a they have proprietary equipment that they're able to do both. And uh, it was really, really great um, having them out here and kind of learning from them about some of these techniques. Uh, and so then we the, we trapped inside this area here, but that trapping was ineffective when the spray was put on the mating disruption because it it made it nullified the effects of our traps for attracting male moths. But we still had the traps as a as a buffer here all around the outside of that, and so um, there were no moths caught in 2017 when we did the treatment. But we we delimbed for three more years uh, up through last season, and so far we have not caught any moths in this area. I'm not quite done with the sample still <laughs> from last year, but I'm almost done, and um, I'm pretty sure this is clean now which means our eradication worked. So pretty happy about that. And um, so anyway, uh, in 2018 though, we found a new find in Douglas County. I showed this before. This was near Roseburg and Winston, about equidistant. And um, 
this was this was DLIM trapped for two years and we didn't come up with anything. Again, 2020 was the, the second year for that. No new moths. Um, where that moth came from, we're really not sure. It wasn't right near nurseries, but apparently there were some, and I never visited this area, but um, others have told me that there were some new uh, um, home areas that were established, I guess, out in this fringe area here. And they have a lot of newly planted yards with probably new nursery stock and stuff. So it could have come in there. Um, the big news is, is as Chantel knows, <laughs> and a lot of other people know, that we did have uh, a new one found right in the middle of Portland in the Brooklyn area last year. So we've got a new DLIM. Bad news is USDA has pulled their funding for this program now. And so it is, if, if we don't have the funding to do the general trapping and to keep our guard up for this, it is much more likely it will get missed and established in Oregon. Um, but for now, we've got enough traps to do the, um, the delimitation in Portland. Moving on, um, programs in Eastern Oregon. What time am I at here? Oh dear, this is running really long. Um, programs in Eastern Oregon, um, two of the big programs there, they look for apple maggot in the growing areas in um, Hermiston, Milton Freewater, <clears throat> and a few other areas in Eastern Oregon. And I believe they're under a control area <clears throat> to, um, to keep those apple, ma apple maggots in control. So when they're found, they have to spray. Um, grasshoppers have also had a huge outbreak last year, and Harney County, I think, was the largest area where they had um, uh, massive outbreak numbers, and so they are planning eradication in some of the areas of uh, southeast Oregon. Um, and there's other federal projects out there as well. Um, I don't think ETPP was right. But we are doing some wood board delimitations, and there's also a nursery survey, at least one of the nurseries out there. Um, we're planning on doing that. <clears throat> we're also doing an um, oak pest survey. Um, this, is, this, is this, this is kind of a nice map. It shows oak distribution and sort of the different kinds of oak distribution in Oregon and, and some of the mixed oak um, areas here. Um, but but we're we're going to be looking at an oak survey this year, hopefully covering at least the northern part and maybe in the Wasco County here. Um, but we're looking for six moth species, four beetle species, and we've also got vespid wasps in um, piggybacked in with that survey. Uh, we'll be using funnel traps, bucket traps, sticky traps, and these gallon jug traps that will have a liquid bait for the wasps. Um, and these are, like I mentioned, in Western Oregon and also in Wasco County. And so we'll be looking for a suitable oak habitat near those potential high-risk sites. Uh, we also got a nursery survey. And I'm going to throw in here too that a lot of a lot of you people doing the trapping are probably not going to be involved in some of these other surveys. But it's good to know kind of what we're doing as a group and what's going on in the state, just so you're aware, um, whether or not you're actually involved as part of your uh, trapping duties. Uh, we're doing a nursery survey. Um, got five moth species, two wood borers, and a leaf beetle. And uh, most of these will be set by probably the lab staff, and we're not sure if some nursery inspectors will be helping out with um, the servicing for some of these traps, or um, if a few of the survey techs will be able to help out in, in some capacity. It depends on field office and area, where these things are, who's doing what. Um, we've got exotic wood borer um, delimitation trapping in a number of places. We've got like 100 sites in Wasco County in the Dalles, um, 10 sites in Umatilla County. We've got 15 sites in Multnomah County. Um, and for EWB surveys, this is exotic wood borer, by the way, the EWB, exotic wood borers. Um, 
we've got a site in Coos County, one in Lane County, and four sites in Multnomah County. And uh, of course, the wood borers are brought in with solid wood packing material, so like uh, pallet material, stuff like that. And also raw uh, railroad ties from the southeast US. That's, that's another big pathway. Um, people moving firewood, which they shouldn't do. Um, that's still a big problem. And even other lumber coming from a variety of places. So there's a lot of places that process lumber in some capacity or another. <clears throat> and those, those could be high risk places. And uh, of course, Asian giant hornet is going to be a threat now because it was found in Washington, Canada. So we're starting looking for that. Um, and we've got eight sites for the Hornet in Multnomah County. Oops. Hey, Rich. Yeah. We in Creek, you went tell it at 15 the other day. Oh, did you? Yeah, we got another Trico site. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Josh told me that. Yeah, that's going to be 15 now. I was going off the big list. <laughs> old news, not fake news, old news. Um, so you'll have something probably given to you called the program summary. It's uh, like a three page thing and it kind of summarizes, um, kind of what we're doing. It's got sort of the species code that, and the uh, trap and lure type. You'll see this, you'll see this information in your, in trap man on your phone. When you get that, when you start setting traps, this will, this will make a lot more sense. Um, it also has the uh, the lure change and the interval here, and like how many traps per site for this particular uh, pest. It, and these are some some of these are grouped by survey. So you'll see over here these are all the nursery pests that we're looking for in the nursery survey, and then they're kind of color coded to. Whoops, guy keeps doing that. Dumb mouse. Um, so we've got these. Uh, they're color coded. This is the oak survey here, and then up onto this page, there's one line that's all oak, and then you can see these other different ones are are broken out that way. And this is the light brown apple moth, which again is only the delimitation in Portland. So, so you'll see that, and um, that that'll probably be helpful for kind of seeing what's going on. So, uh, for sample submission, um, all of the samples that you collect. Um, with the exception of probably the gypsy moth um, traps. Although if you do have positives, those will come to the lab, but pretty much everything will come through the lab uh, one way or another. And um, just a little background on the lab. We are now a national diagnostic laboratory and we're funded by USDA um, to assist other states with their identifications. And our, our our wood borer identification team has been a regional ID center for a number of years, but we have recently been, been um, funded as a national uh, diagnostic lab. And so we can take on pretty much any surveys that um, other states need help with um, for their identification work. Um, a lot of states are very, have very small detection programs, very small staffing loads, and so they need help with their identification work. They don't have the staff to do that or the or the train the train people <clears throat> um, in addition to what we do in Oregon. Uh, we've got about seven people in the lab. Um, Josh is our state taxonomist, state taxonomist. He replaced Jim Labonte uh, last year. Um, and we also will have two lead entomologists, uh, three technical specialist entomologists. Uh, Josh Dunlap, our imaging specialist, and also got a shout out for Amber here. She's also does samples for us. She's a huge help in our lab, and she does that usually in the off season. Um, so she's she's an important part of our lab as well. And um, so we look at thousands of samples and hundreds of thousands of insects every year. So uh, samples are mostly of two types. Um, we've got sample cups that can have alcohol, so it'd be like a wet sample, and then we've got dry dry cups. Uh, there'll be a dry sample, so they won't have any alcohol in them to preserve the specimens. And then there's sticky traps or trap inserts. <clears throat> so these will get turned into your field office coordinator. Um, you can do that either during staff meetings. Um, a lot of you will probably be going into the office. 
on a daily basis, either to get vehicles or supplies or because you're working in that area, whatever reason. And you could drop those off daily if you collected samples the, the day before something, you could drop those off daily. Um, more frequently is better. Um, they'll get put into the freezers or some other storage area and they'll be brought to the lab as, as soon as they can. Um, and so for the sample cups, so the alcohol samples are usually from funnel traps or pitfalls. We're not doing pitfalls this year. This is a funnel trap, a Lindgren funnel, and this will have lures on it. And what happens is the, the insects see this and they'll fall into this collection cup here that has a mixture of antifreeze and water. And, um, and so then this, the, uh, that cup is then um, um, put into, or the, the contents from the cup will be put into one of these sample cups. And the process for that, um, there's a, a video for the funnel trap um, placing and technique and sample collection and all of that. And that is really good to watch that if you're involved with these, these traps at all. I would watch the, the video for that. And I believe it is um, on, it's a Forest Service website has it, but I think maybe our YouTube channel has it as well. I'm not sure. But if you Google uh, Oregon funnel trapping, something like that, it'll probably come up. Um, let's see. And then dry samples uh, will come from the bucket traps. This is a universal bucket trap, usually used for moths. And the lure goes in here, the moth, comes in, kind of hits that and drops down into this bucket. Uh, these buckets will have like a little kill strip um, kind of hanging over the side on a trap tag. And, um, and so that'll kill whatever goes into the bucket. But there's no liquid in the bottom of this. There's like a crumpled up paper towel to kind of keep things from breaking too much in there. Um, and so these, uh, you would twist off this bucket that would get poured into the sample cup. And, and then like a little piece of paper towel on the inside of, of the dry cups um, to keep those kind of intact. And these are only gonna be used this year in the nursery survey. So again, if you're not involved with that, probably not gonna see those. Um, but bottom line for these, these samples, the cup samples is you're gonna have a sticky label on the outside of the cup and a non-sticky regular paper label on the inside. And these, these labels have to be filled out completely. We want complete data. So whatever the, you know, the data you've got um, from your trap card, trap man, um, you need to put uh, like the collection date on here and all the other relevant information on any sample that you're gonna turn in. And we'll get through this here a little bit more in a second. And you want to do this in pencil. Can't emphasize this enough. Um, in the past, people have used felt pen or ballpoint pen. Um, and these ones that have alcohol especially, the alcohol just bleeds the ink from the label. And then the label is no longer readable. And even alcohol can spill onto the outside label that is stuck to the outside of the cup. Um, so like even an accident can like ruin the label, and stuff like that. So really important, do these labels in pencil and um, you'll be great. You can't do anything better. This is an example of the nursery label uh, for this year. So um, this would be an example if I if I had a funnel trap for Trichopharis campestris. This is Trichopharis campestris, kind of a two-letter genus species combination. Um, this one also used an ethanol lure, so it has a plus E on here. It has its own lure plus an ethanol lure on that trap. So if you're collecting the sample, we need to know which sample it was from because all of these will use sample cups and they're all part of the nursery survey. And so you would circle the trap that it came from and what that lure was and everything. And then you're gonna put the, the nursery on here. I just made one up, dark winds. Uh, nursery, and then um, you're going to put your site number. I'll go over site number again in a minute. Uh, technician initials, and then the date. Really important. Put the date on there. All of this is important. You want all of this information. Fill everything out on these labels. Um, the barcode. You can use the last five digits when putting barcodes on things because the first four digits are the year. So it's going to all your barcodes are going to say 2021 
and then they'll have five digits. So we want at least that five digit number um, for the barcode number. But you got to make sure you put the year here <laughs> as well. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, these these three here are the uh, the um, bucket traps for moths. They're dry traps for moths, and these are going to be funnel traps this year. And this is an example. Oh yeah, of course here I have it. So these these circle. This shows some of the sort of the nuances between these. I know this just looks at like a like a poor attempt at Venn diagrams or something, but um, this is just pointing out some of the differences in some of the surveys. So these are like moth traps. We've also have a visual component to the nursery survey this year. Um, oak survey and other um, uh, funnel trapping sites um, have uh, uh, Xyloborus monographus traps. This is another funnel trap. It's written different than this one because this, this the the thing we're trapping for is this species, but it's that is the 4E lure is the lure for that species. Whereas this one, this is a 4 ethanol on, on that trap. Whereas this one, the ethanol is in addition to a lure for this species. So I'm trying to make that more clear, probably making it worse, but trying to make it more clear. Um, this here is another combination where we have an alpha pinene and an ethanol lure and a, a monocamus lure as well. So that would be on one trap. And this is a separate kind of trap, separate kind of trap, and then this is a separate trap. Um, also, we've got Vespa as part of the oak and the multi as well, or the um, various wood bore things. So if you have uh, a trap that you're looking for the hornets, you would circle the Vespa. So you want to circle the appropriate trap uh, for that survey or in what you're collecting, and then fill out the tag completely in pencil. And most of you will use the JB tags. A lot of you in the Portland field office will be working in the JB delimitation area and you will have a piece of that. And, um, and so filling this out, uh, talk to your field office coordinator, they will go over this with you. But we've got um, number of Japanese beetle and the number alive and so, um, they'll tell you more about collecting that data, what it means, <clears throat> and if your trap has an uh, oriental beetle lure, if you, you look on your maps, you'll see whether or not that, that also has this kind of a lure on it, the OB, um, you would include that, you would want to circle that in addition to uh, the JB. Um, and then sticky traps, um, this would be an example, again, this is the light brown apple moth trap, this would be what either the trap bottom or the insert would look like. Um, this is really hard to explain. It's much easier to show. So maybe I'll just kind of power through this. Most of you probably won't have this kind of trap again this year, um, but some will. Um, you want to write, now on, when you're writing on the outside of the trap or on the bottom of the sticky insert before you put it in the trap, um, you want to use felt markers for these. You have broad tip felt markers. And if you write on the bottom of the trap, they will not fade in the sunlight. Um, they'll be good and legible. You will also have your barcode, the actual barcode stuck onto the bottom of this trap shell. Um, and so um, when, you're, when you're writing the barcode number, you can write that on the bottom of this insert. So what you would be turning in, you would leave the shell in the field when you're servicing it, but you're gonna turn this insert in periodically. And so what you wanna write on here is the lure type. So in this case, it's light brown apple moth. You put your abbreviation there. You've got the site number, and the, this is a full site number. And what that consists of is the county series. In this case, 47 is Marion County. Um, the tech series number, so you'll have, you might have a series like the 15,000 series, and so this would be the 15,000 series. Um, so that's gonna be your, sort of your trapper identification number, if you will. You'll have a certain series number that you'll work through. And then you have a specific site number, and that will be a three digit number on the end of that. And so I can go back up, you'd see the complete number would look something like that. Um, 
And so then you'll have your barcode number again written on the on the bottom of the insert. This really is more of what the bottom of the insert looks like. Again, you'll have if it's the bottom of the trap, you'll have the full, you'll have the actual barcode stuck on the trap shell. <clears throat> and then you have dates and service activity. Um, and this is where things get complicated. So um, if you have like a these are these are usually used for fruit fly. This is a yellow panel trap, but they're also used in our nursery survey um, for one of the um, leaf beetles, the Diabrotica leaf beetle. So these traps fold uh, along this back, and so you fold them over and then latch them together here like this. But you can write on the inside of this trap, not on the sticky surface, obviously, but you can write on the inside of this. And so you can you can write this information on the inside, um, and you can probably put a, the barcode on there as well. Um, it's good to try and not change the barcode through the season because it identifies that type of trap at that particular location for the entire season. Um, you need to talk to your field office coordinator. I, I could make this even longer and I don't want to. So I've talked to your field office coordinator about how to um, creatively use your barcode so that um, you just write it on this when you turn it in and the actual barcode is either on the back of your trap card or hanging from whatever is hanging this trap or hanging off the bottom. You can pull it off and restaple it to the new trap when you replace it. Um, uh, this is a different kind of trap where the whole trap gets turned in as well. This is a moth trap. This will be used for a few species in our oak survey. And um, again, you can you can tie the the barcode to um, you can you can tie it to the uh, the wire here and then remove it and attach it to the new trap that's replacing this trap when you're servicing those. So um, again, this gets complicated. It's easier to show than just go over in a PowerPoint. But anyway, you need to have um, this information on an insert or on the whole trap. And if you have an insert with a trap, you need it on both, like that light brown apple moth trap I showed. So this shows the dates and activity. Um, this would be when you placed it. You go back, say, whatever your service interval, and you're going to have a, a check, and you're going to change the lure and you're going to turn in the insert um, and then you go back again and the key thing here every time you go out the most important thing you can do is to write that day's date on everything you're doing <laughs> so you write it on the bottom of the trap you write it on the insert you write it on your trap card and you're going to enter it in trap man you want you just want to put that day's date on everything and you won't go wrong don't forget to put the dates on things when you're servicing. Um, I can't say that enough times because every year I'll get this information and it'll be really inconsistent. <laughs> and so I will say it again, write that day's date when you're out in the field, write that day's date on everything. Okay. Um, and so what this actually shows too is when you get a range of dates like this, this will show the last time you were in the field. This will show the most recent time you were in the field. You're going to write it on the insert, today's date, let's say the day you were out. Um, you're going to turn that in. You're going to get a new insert. You're going to write all this information, including that day's date. You're going to put it back in the trap um, before you leave the site. And so when you turn this in, what happens is I, I want to make sure we have the narrowest window possible to show when something might have flown in the trap. So whatever's on that insert flew into the trap during this window from the last time it was changed to when you're picking it up. And the narrower that window is, the more we can um, cue in on when something went in a trap. And that's really important for figuring out flight, flight times and stuff. Um, and so when you turn these samples in, uh, this is the best way to turn in an insert. So this is a light brown apple moth insert. 
You can see a few bugs on here on the inside of it. What you want to do is roll it against the seam. So these these are like cards. They're folded together, and you you open them along a seam and flatten them out like that. You write on write on them before you open them, and then open them up, you know, and then put them in the trap. But when you when you pull them out of the trap, you want to roll them against the seam. And they'll make a nice smooth curve when you do that. You won't be smashing anything on the inside of the trap. And just bring the corners together and then staple them with your uh, your uh, pliers type staplers that you guys have. Um, oops. Let's see. Yeah, so this is another kind of a trap that uses an insert. It's a wing trap, and that'll be in. Um, at least one of our surveys this year. I'm not sure if it's oak and or nursery, maybe. Um, but it has an insert as well, and you can roll that one too, uh, just like this one, and just staple the corners. That's perfect. Do it this way. You can't do anything better. Um, let's see. And then um, the best way to store these after you're collecting them, just put them into paper grocery bags if you can. Um, they can just stack in there like. Uh, like little logs, you know, and they stack really well in, in paper bags and then turn them into your coordinator. And it's it's nice to keep these samples separate from the different surveys. So if you're doing light brown apple moth, just, just turn those in separate from any nursery samples or oak samples. It just helps in going through those. Um, oh, thank God, that's it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'll answer more questions. Wait, wake up. Sorry, I'm getting tired. You can make me not presenter now. <laughs> <laughs>